It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce U.S. Congressman Paul Ryan. Currently serving as, uh, in his seventh term representing Wisconsin's first congressional district, he is the chairman of the House Budget Committee, uh, where he works to bring fiscal discipline and accountability to federal government. He is also a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over tax policy, social security, health care, and trade laws. Paul uh, has put forward a specific plan uh, to tackle our looming fiscal crisis uh, driven by the explosion of entitlement spending. Uh, he, his book uh, titled The Path to Prosperity helps spur job creation today, stops spending money uh, the government doesn't have, and lifts the crushing burden of debt. Uh, this plan puts the budget on the path to balance uh, uh, to balance and the economy on the path to prosperity. He will speak today uh, on, quote, the optimist's guide to repeal and replace patient-centered health care reform for the 21st century. Following his remarks, uh, Congressman Ryan will take some questions. I urge you, uh, when he calls on you, to please do your best to pause and wait for a microphone to come to you so that not only your colleagues here can hear you, but the uh, webcast uh, that is happening today uh, will also uh, hear. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome uh, to the Honorable Paul Ryan. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> John, I really appreciate that. It's, um, it's a beautiful place, by the way. It's really great here, and Stanford's doing pretty well this year in football. Hopefully, they'll meet Wisconsin Badgers in the National Championship BCS game, so that'd be neat to see. Um, it's kind of you to invite me here, John, uh, and I hope you don't hold it against me that I steal a lot of ideas from people here at Hoover. Um, it's true. I steal monetary policy ideas from John Taylor. I steal rule of law stuff from Richard Epstein, and I, um, I even tried to steal some wit and humor from Peter Robinson this morning. So if this speech falls flat, blame Robinson, all right? <clears throat> uh, but today I'm here to talk about health care. This is a subject that I find it hard to be funny about, especially since the Democrats stole all the health care jokes and enacted them into law. <laughs> <clears throat> I had to pause for that one for a second there. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the consequences of this law are no joke. And the first step toward true patient-centered Healthcare reform must be the full repeal of the president's disastrous new law. If we engage the nation in a serious debate and put forward a principled reform agenda, then I think that the odds are really pretty good that the Republican Party will soon find itself with the opportunity to do just that. But we cannot simply stop at repeal. We also have a responsibility to fix the broken network of government policies that have made such a mess of healthcare in America. If that process and if that notion excites you, it should. We have the right ideas on healthcare, and a change of power in Washington would bring with it an opportunity to turn these ideas into good public policy. But if that prospect worries you, well, I can understand why. The political hurdles that stand in the way of real, Structural health care reform are daunting. And while Republicans have advanced many good ideas in health care, it is my candid opinion that the party as a whole has yet to coalesce around a complete reform agenda aimed at dealing with the underlying problem, which is runaway inflation in the cost of health care. Today, I want to attempt to make a case for optimism. Specifically, I come bearing three pieces of good news. First piece of good news is this. The urgent need to repeal and replace the president's health care law, coupled with the urgent need to deal with the drivers of our debt, will present us with an unavoidable time for choosing, allowing us to confront health care inflation head on. The second piece of good news is this. Thanks to the tireless work of health policy scholars here at Hoover and elsewhere, we know what works and what doesn't work. Simply put, Badly designed government policies are to blame for much of what is wrong with healthcare today, 
And the solution is clear. We need to transition from an open-ended, defined benefit approach of the past to market-oriented, defined contribution reforms that promote choice and competition. And the third piece of good news is this. Though the political hurdles are high, we know that we can win these fights within the conservative movement, across party lines, and across the nation. The challenge will be to summon the courage and the ability to offer Americans a true choice of two futures on health care, which is a choice that they quite frankly deserve. So the times require action. We have the right ideas, and the politics are clearly possible. Let's take each of these three reasons for optimism in order. First, we know we have the opportunity to enact reforms. Even before the president's law made matters worse, Americans faced serious problems in health care, and we simply cannot revert to the status quo. In the wake of repeal, we must be ready to advance solutions. To get the prescription right, we need to properly diagnose the problem, starting with the reasons why the president's law is such a failure. At its core, the health care problems is one of inflation, driven by the overutilization of services, dramatic underpayments, and massive inefficiency. If you look closely, the reason is easy to see. The health care sector lacks the most of basic building blocks of the functioning marketplace. For one thing, markets require transparent prices so that consumers can discover value. But in healthcare, the consumer is usually either a big insurance company or the government. Healthcare providers have no incentive to provide transparent prices to their patients because their patients don't pay directly. It's the government bureaucrat or the insurance company bureaucrat who pays the bills. Second, Markets do not function well when the consumers are insulated from the marginal costs. We're all paying more for health care through much higher premiums and taxes, but the share we pay at the doctor's office has plunged. The system that shields us from the cost of services has actually left us paying much, much more. Rather than tackle these root drivers of the problem, the president's law goes in the other direction. It expands broken government programs. It enhances bureaucratic control and it imposes flawed mandates that will continue to drive up the cost of care. Where there were cost-containing tools that help patients reduce their exposure to exploding costs, such as health savings accounts, the president's law essentially dismantled them. But the law's new open-ended entitlement programs are its biggest failure. One of them has been described as a classic insurance death spiral, and the other requires an additional trillion in new federal health spending. Both are fiscally unsustainable, and estimates suggest that the costs would be much higher than initially projected. And that is ultimately where the president's health care law falls short. If you look at our debt and deficits problem, it's really a health care spending problem. Today, excluding interest, approximately one-fourth of government spending goes toward government health care programs like Medicare and Medicaid. By the time my three kids are my age, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, the share of federal spending going to just pay for health care programs will reach 45%. And the new health care law does nothing to address the pressures that escalating health care costs are putting on the federal budget. In fact, our CBO director, Doug Elmendorf, said, according, in reference to the new law, it does not substantially diminish that pressure. Instead, it doubles down on the flawed design of open-ended, subsidized government health care. The result? Well... No secret. It's a healthcare system characterized by overutilization and inefficiency in which costs are rising at two to three times the rate of growth of GDP. As any family on a budget can tell you, when one fourth of your budget is growing three times faster than your income, you are in deep trouble. All other priorities get squeezed as you fall deeper into debt. Well, that is exactly the situation our government finds itself in today. There is no serious dispute on either side of the aisle that health care inflation is the primary driver of our unsustainable deficits. As President Obama put it, quote, if you look at the numbers, Medicare in particular will run out of money, and we will not be able to sustain that program no matter how much taxes go up, close quote. And Democratic officials will even admit that the primary driver of health care inflation is the current structure of government programs. 
as HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius recently testified regarding Medicare's flawed fee-for-service structure, quote, I would say that the current fee-for-service system, yes, is unsustainable. So the disagreement isn't really about the problem. It's about how best to control costs in government health care programs. And if I could sum up that disagreement in a couple of sentences, I would say this. Our plan is to empower patients. Their plan is to empower bureaucrats. Just last week, the president rolled out a deficit reduction plan that doubled down on his bureaucratic approach to controlling Medicare costs, first advanced in his health care law last year. The law empowers a board of 15 unelected officials, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, otherwise known as IPAB, not IPAD, IPAB. <laughs> this board is to hold down the cost and growth of Medicare to GDP plus 1%, reducing reimbursements to health care providers. Unless overturned by a supermajority in Congress, the recommended cuts dictated by this unelected board become law. Well, the president's latest proposal simply called for having IPAB to cut deeper. This board of bureaucrats will now be tasked with holding Medicare's cost growth to GDP plus half a percent. To put that in context, Medicare is currently growing at 6.3% per year. Medicare's nonpartisan chief actuary, Rick Foster, has been clear on this point. Going from 6% growth down to the president's targets, using only the blunt tools that this law gives to the IPAB, would simply drive Medicare providers out of business, resulting in harsh disruptions and denied care for seniors. In fact, the deterioration of seniors' care that is projected to occur under IPAB would be so untenable the board is unlikely to yield any savings at all. Future Congresses would be under tremendous pressure to undo the cuts, just as past Congresses have time and again reversed the scheduled cuts to physicians' pay. Pain cannot be sustained. You cannot control costs by using price controls. These impose painful cuts within a fundamentally broken framework. Instead, you have to revisit the structure of federal health policy and change the incentives, something that many leading Democrats, with their unwavering commitment to early 20th century social insurance models, seem to remain totally unwilling to do. This leads me to my second piece of good news. We know that there is a better way forward, a way that accounts for both the benefits and the failures of those 20th century models and builds upon the good while reforming the bad. The House passed budget offers a better way to strengthen Medicare and save it from insolvency. Instead of using cram downs that simply pay providers less while jeopardizing seniors' care, our budget proposes real reforms designed to slow the growth of healthcare costs economy-wide by promoting true choice and competition. Empowering seniors, not bureaucrats, is the best way to save and strengthen Medicare. At a House budget hearing just last July, Chief Actuary Rick Foster gave evidence in support of this approach, and I want to quote, we've estimated for many years that competition among plans in a premium support setting like this could have advantages and lead to somewhat lower costs for Medicare. It can get you to the lowest cost consistent with good quality care, close quote. And not just in Medicare. Choice and competition are critical to controlling costs and throughout the entire healthcare system while improving quality for patients. And yet across the federal landscape, Choice and competition are undermined by poorly designed programs and tax policies. In Medicare, the government reimburses all providers of care according to one-size-fits-all formulas, even if the quality of the care they provide is poor and the cost is high. This top-down delivery system exacerbates wastes because none of the primary stakeholders has a strong incentive to deliver the best quality care for the lowest possible price. In Medicaid, a flawed federal state matching formula is blowing out state budgets. There is no limit on the federal government's matching contributions to state spending. So state governments spend most of their time devising ways to maximize how much they can get from the federal government, rather than focusing on de delivering high quality, cost effective coverage for most of their vulnerable citizens. Beyond these two programs, our current tax code provides additional fuel 
for runaway health care inflation. Under the current law, employer-sponsored health care plans are entirely exempt from taxation, regardless of how much an individual contributes to their policy. This tilts the compensation scale toward benefits which are tax-free and away from higher wages which are taxable. It also provides ways for high-income earners to artificially reduce their taxable income by purchasing high-cost health coverage, which in turn can fuel the overuse of health services. The new law's attempts to deal with this problem will not work. They merely add a layer of taxation to a flawed tax structure when what we need is to change the structure from the bottom up. All of these structural flaws push affordable coverage out of reach for millions of Americans. Programs designed to shelter individuals from prices of health care programs, they have backfired. Instead, these programs have the unintended consequence of increasing health care costs for all Americans, causing rising premiums to road workers' paychecks and leaving many Americans with no coverage at all. The solution in each of these areas is to move away from defined benefit models and toward defined contribution systems. Under a reformed approach, the government would make a defined contribution to the health security of every American, rather than continue to offer open-ended, well-intentioned, but ultimately empty promises. The growth of these contributions should be capped to ensure the inefficiencies that have led to health care costs to spiral out of control are reduced. But they also should be adjustable so that more help goes to the poor and the sick, while the less financial support goes to those who are fortunate enough to need it the least. In other words, defined contributions should underpin a system driven by patient choice and centered on patient needs, the one that offers real security instead of offering empty promises. In Medicare, a patient-centered reform means premium support. This is the approach advanced in the House passed budget and also on a bipartisan basis with Alice Rivlin and other Democrats who understand the need to move toward increased choice and competition in health care. In Medicaid, patient-centered reforms mean block grants to state governments so that they are freed from the onerous federal mandates and empowered to design Medicaid programs to meet the unique needs of their citizens, such as providing vouchers to low-income families so they have the dignity of having private insurance just like everyone else in society has. Many governors wrote to us after we included this reform in the House passed budget to simply thank us for advancing an idea whose time has come. And with regard to health insurance for working Americans, patient-centered reform means replacing the inefficient tax treatment of employer-provided health care with a portable, refundable tax credit that you can take with you from job to job allowing you to hang on to your insurance even during those tough times when finding a job is a hard thing to do. We should empower patients, not only with resources and choices, but also with information. Patient-centered reform must promote transparency on price and quality and give patients the incentive to act on this information. By putting the power into the hands of individuals, we can let competition work in healthcare just like it does everywhere else. Instead of top-down price controls imposed by 15 bureaucrats at IPAB, let's try bottom-up competition driven by 300 million consumers. We know that the first step toward real bipartisan advances in health policy must start with full repeal of the president's partisan law. But the case for repeal must be matched with even greater intensity by a case or replace. Replacing the law with structural reforms and real solutions to the problems Americans are facing in health care. The three reforms I've just outlined, premium support for Medicare, block grant for Medicaid, and tax reform to correct the inefficient tax treatment of health insurance must be present in our replace agenda. If we end up with a replace agenda that fails to fix the problem, then we will simply lose the hard-won credibility on the health care issue as a result. Look, I understand how daunting the politics of these issues are. I've lived them. So I know that the political hurdles to real reform are great. But we can clear these hurdles if we combine political courage and clarity of purpose with faith in the American people. I'll be honest with you. When I first put out my Roadmap for America's Future a number of years ago, if you had asked me 
whether I would take the bet on whether we would have premium support in our budget this year, well, I would have needed pretty good odds to take that bet. One of my own staffers who helped me write this thing recently reminded me, I would have laughed out loud if you told me that. Well, here we are today. All but four Republican members of the House of Representatives and all but five Republican members of the United States Senate Republican Caucus voted for our, pros our path to prosperity budget, Medicare reforms and all. And though we took a few dings at first, we survived. The Democrats tried the same old scare tactics for a few months. And in the first special election that took place after our budget passed, we learned a costly lesson. We learned that unless we back up our, our ideas with courage and defend them in the face of attacks, we will lose. But once we learned that lesson and started to get our message out, well, a funny thing happened. People listened. They learned that our plan did not affect those in or near retirement, that it guaranteed coverage options like the ones members of Congress enjoy, and that choice and competition would drive costs down and quality up. They also learned more about the Democrats' plan for Medicare. And they didn't like what they heard. And the scare tactics stopped working. Just look at what happened earlier this month in the recent special elections next door in Nevada and out in New York. The Democrats threw every scare tactic they could think of at the Republican candidates running in these two special elections for vacant House seats. But the attacks failed to connect with voters hungry for solutions, and the Republican candidates prevailed. Now, certainly, there are some mitigating factors in these races. The economy is unquestionably at the forefront of the nation's concerns, and the president's unpopularity def definitely played a role. And in Brooklyn, uh, the race to replace former Congressman Anthony Weiner, well, I don't want to get into all the factors that influenced that race. Uh, as Peter Robinson reminded me this morning before we taped this program, if you want to talk about the New York race, remember this is a family show. Um, <laughs> here's the point. The point is that we should not fear false attacks again in 2012. Fear and demagoguery are the last refuges of an interly bankrupt party. And the moment calls for leaders who are not afraid to be honest with people about how they would solve the problems that we face. In healthcare, we owe the American people a defining choice. And the choice is this. Who do you want to be in charge, the government or the patient? What we need in healthcare is more efficiency and productivity so that the pace of rising healthcare costs slows in the coming years. How is that going to come about? Certainly not with more bureaucrats r running things from Washington, D.C. They've been trying that for decades, and they have only made matters worse. What will work is empowered consumers looking for value. Give patients and consumers control over health care resources. That would make all Americans less dependent on big business and big government for our health security. Give us more control over the care we get and force health care providers to compete for our business. So those are my three pieces of good news. We have a great opportunity to enact real reform in health care. The wisdom of our leading thinkers has shown us how to do it, and our budget has demonstrated that we can survive the demagoguery and the attacks if we gather our courage, stay true to our guiding principles, and contrast our approach with the same old failed policies offered by the defenders of the bankrupt status quo. This is how we are able to defend our path to prosperity budget. It is how we are able to defuse the Medicare attacks in two special elections. And it is how we will unite the country to do what is right, both for this generation and for the next. Thank you very, very much. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. You may. Sure. Let me ask about your personal health care. If I recall, your father, grandfather, and great-grandfather died of heart attacks young in their lives. What are you doing to try to make sure that doesn't happen? Are you a cardiologist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My uncle is. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, Orion hasn't lived in my direct family uh, to the age of 60 in three generations. Um, so. My dad died at 55 at a heart attack, uh, grandfather 57, um, worked out every single day, 
stretch on the seventh day, so work out six days a week, watch my diet, um, and, and just kind of pay attention to it. Um, I'm 41. My uncle who's a cardiologist says I need to start taking statins as sort of a preventative. Um, I'll get around to that, I suppose, but uh, I don't want to get too deep into my own personal health care issues here. But to me, it's about exercise and diet, and get those things right, and you're going to be okay. Yeah? Oh, wait, you've got to wait for the mic. She seems to be. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I'd like to hear uh, what your plan says about the health insurance industry. I think it's great to uh, foster competition among um, the insurance companies, but it seems to me the trend has been for a consolidation of the health Absolutely. insurance industry. And I think, um, you know, the increased mandates of the Obama plan to, about pre-existing conditions, you know, those are legitimate issues, but obviously they're going to run up the, the cost of health insurance. And, uh, and many health insurance companies spend far more of their premium on administrative costs, mm -hmm. executive pay, and so on. So isn't it important to include some reform measures of the health insurance Absolutely. industry as a part of this plan? Yeah, look at the incentive structure for health insurers. It's get a pool of people that are relatively healthy, make your spread with your reserves, and then after the, the, the pool sort of ages out, start over again. So I would say the incentive structure is misaligned between the patient and the insurer. So you want to align those. Um, whatever you do, don't do what the current law does because the current law is going to lead to a massive consolidation of health insurance companies. You know, a lot of smart economists and actuaries tell us there are going to be about five or six insurers left in America when it's all said and done when the president's health care law comes into force. They'll basically be de facto public utilities. I met with one of the largest insurers and their actuaries not too long ago who told me, well, we currently manage uh, Medicaid for several states. And now that we're preparing for this new health care exchange, the health insurance that we're going to be offering in the exchange and all of our competitors will as well is the same thing as Medicaid. So it's really going to bring us to a Medicaid for all system. I really believe that the current system will collapse. Number one, the president's law is designed to encourage employers to dump their employees into the exchange at which they'll have a few choices to choose from between insurers that are basically federally managed and regulated. So I'd go in a completely different direction. Number one, let's have more competition within insurance, not less. Uh, interstate um, shopping is a big part of that, I think, which is allow people to buy insurance across state lines. Number two, let's look at um, what is driving up a lot of costs? Uh, I think transparency is a big, important part of it. So you have a shopping incentive. You have insurance products where you have more skin in the game as a, as a consumer with higher deductible plans. Um, you can design these in many different ways so that a lower income individual has the resources within their, say, health savings account to buy it. So you have that shopping incentive, that, that, that consumer approach put in there. But number three, um, the actuaries tell us that as much as 8% of the under 65 population in America are in the category we would call pre-existing conditions. So that's where a lot of the costs go to. And those are hard to predict, who's going to get that. And it makes the price of insurance much more volatile. So why not uh, finance risk pools at the state level um, to cover the, that population, protect their premiums from sticker shock. So the woman who's 47 years old who gets breast cancer, you know, doesn't have to sell her house and go bankrupt just to pay for her Avastin injections. You know, have that paid for protect her premiums, but you do a couple of things. Not only do you prevent that woman from going bankrupt, you get her into a system that has preventative medicine and disease management, you dramatically stabilize the pricing of risk for the other 92% of the population um, that is not in that category, and you dramatically improve the competition and pricing of insurance for everybody else. So to me, put the money where it ought to go. We spend two and a half times per person on healthcare in this country more than any other industrialized world. We spend about 17% of our economy on this area. So instead of running the money through third parties, run it through the individual, the money ought to go to the people who need it the most, the poor and the sick, and away from those who need it the least, the wealthy and the healthy. And do it in such a way that encourages competition so that insurers and doctors and hospitals and other providers are competing against each other for our business in a patient-centered system where they are the nucleus of the, of the, uh, of the health care um, economy, not the result. I can go on and on, but I would simply say more insurance competition, more transparency, um, 
Find a way to deal with the pre-existing. I think risk pools are probably the smartest way of doing that so that the insurer has more competition for your business, not less. And I think that's a fundamentally different approach. You have to deal with the lawsuit issue and a lot of other things. And I think if you do those basic building blocks of a market economy, I think you'll have far, far better results. And this sector of our economy will be a source of innovation and growth and not a drag in our economy. Sorry for the long answer, but it's, it's an important question. Yeah. How about that? Oh, okay. Um, you mentioned sort of earlier about sort of the lawsuit issue. I was sort of curious as to what your thoughts were on tort reform in the healthcare industry, because one thing that's really distorting the economics of our healthcare system all up and down the line is uh, this issue. So I was sort of wondering what your thoughts are. Absolutely, on that. It's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's just sort of of the list of things you need to do. It's it's just way on top of the no-brainer list. Uh, and so it's it, and we can pass these bills. We have through the House. We have many times. Our problem is getting through. Um, the trial lawyer gauntlet in the Senate where you, you have to f face a filibuster. That is a reform that can be filibustered, and we've never been able to get over that. <clears throat> and it's not just the premiums doctors pay, which, which are high, especially for OBGYNs and others. It is the defensive medicine that is practiced as a result of it that, that pumps so much overutilization of healthcare into the system that is a huge cost driver. And so to me, that's just, that's just part and parcel of any legitimate reform to get at the root cause of health inflation. Yeah. Congressman, can you be a little more specific about your uh, ideas on specific tech reform that would affect the deductibility of health insurance? I mean, I think this is a huge issue and could have a profound effect in a positive way of reducing costs. Sure, I'll give you a, the specifics on a bill that I uh, authored uh, in the last session of Congress with uh, Senator Tom Coburn, Richard Byrne, Congressman Devin Nunes from, um, he's just down south of here. I would argue that the tax treatment of health care is one of the key drivers of health inflation. And the way it works today, it's about, you know, off the top of my head, about three and a half trillion dollars um, is dedicated toward this tax benefit, which arised arose out of um, World War II wage and price controls. And it gave rise to the third party system we have today, which shields people from price sensitivity, cost sensitivity, and has been, I think, a source of inflation. Um, so what we're saying is, rather than tie your tax benefit to your job, which by the way, we're subsidizing people in the highest tax bracket the most and people in the lowest tax bracket the least. That, that's upside down, that makes no sense. So. Instead of having your tax benefit tied to your job, which gives rise to this third party payment system, delink that tax benefit to the person, to the individual. Uh, and across the board, wait, specifically what our bill did was it was $5,700 for a family for a refundable tax credit. Um, if you're on Medicaid, you get even much, much more than that, about, about $12,000, um, to go toward your out of pocket cost for health insurance. Now, here's the key thing a lot of people get this confused with employer deduction versus employee deduction. The employer, under what we've proposed, still has the ability and the right to write off the provision of health insurance for their employees. So we're not trying to dismantle the employer-sponsored system, which I would argue the president's health care law does. We simply want to equalize the tax treatment. So employers still have the same incentive to offer their employees health insurance, but their employees, instead of having to get this benefit from the job, is given to them, so what happens if they change jobs or lose their job? They still get this tax benefit then to help them with the purchase of health insurance versus the status quo, which is if you lose your job, you lose your, your tax benefit. This is not the 20th century. You don't have the same job for the rest of your life anymore. It's not how the economy works. You move around and change jobs, so we should make this benefit more poor.